is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, I want to talk about emotions or our emotional state in our being. And when I say being, I'm talking about our body, soul, and spirit. And our body, of course, is our physical body. Our soul is often referred to as our emotions, our memories, things like that. And then our spirit is our spiritual man or woman. Now, remember, the Bible teaches us that inside of every human being, every human being is born with a spirit. I'm not talking about a demonic spirit. I'm talking about uh, an individual human spirit. So that that's the reason why that you can't really die. In one sense, in one sense you can die; in the other sense, you cannot die. And by that, I mean uh, your physical body. At some point, every single one of us will die physically or die biologically. That happened ever since Adam and Eve activated the law, spiritual law of sin and death, when they rejected obeying God's word, when they yielded to Satan's wiles or schemes, and they disobeyed God, and they ate from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. For the serpent of old, who was Satan, tempted them through spiritual deception. <clears throat> when uh, Lucifer said to them, inhabiting the, the serpent of old, it's so important to look at these passages of Scripture on a multi-dimensional level. If you're just reading the passages of Scripture and you're not diving into the ocean of God's knowledge, you're going to miss all kinds of stuff. So what we have happening in the Garden of Eden is the devil twisting, seducing, and using evil's primary weapon, which is spiritual deception. And he tempts Eve first, and he says stuff to Eve like, well, you know, God surely hasn't said that you're going to die in in the day that you eat of the forbidden fruit. Well, God did specifically say to Adam and Eve that in the day that you eat, from that fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, you will surely die. That's that's as about definitive as you can get. God is saying, there's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. You disobey me, you eat from that fruit, the tree in the middle of the garden, and you're going to die. So they disobeyed God. They ate, oh, and, and they went back and forth, because you see, the devil uses wiles, which means like schemes and strategies, hypnotic statements. The devil is an expert uh, in mental warfare. And so he would counteract uh, Eve's statements, and and he would lie. Because why, why would he lie? Because Satan is the father of lies. And he would look at Adam and Eve and specifically say to them, Surely God hasn't said that you'll die, but God did say you'll die. So they ate of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, and they did die. And how did they die? They activated a cosmic law called the law of sin and death. So the nanosecond, they ate from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden of Eden. They (coughs) activated the law of sin and death, and instantaneously their consciousness changed. Instantaneously, their spiritual man <clears throat> or woman changed, and they began for for the first time in their life to to degrade. And by degrade, I mean kind of like a biological spiritual decomposition. They began to deteriorate. They began to get sick, and and all these maladies began to come upon them. So, for example, for the first time in their lives, they were ashamed of being naked. Why were they ashamed of being naked? Because in their prior state of consciousness, when they were living uh, as one with God in paradise, the Garden of Eden, 
They had no awareness. They had no consciousness of being naked. But one of the first things that happened when they activated the law of sin and death was that they became aware that they were naked, and then they became ashamed of their nakedness. And so they attempted to hide their nakedness from God by placing, and it sounds ridiculous to us when we, when we hear their, their plan for hiding their nakedness, it, it sounds ridiculous. So they put fig leaves on their bodily parts. And we all know what bodily parts they put their fig leaf, the fig leaves on in an attempt to hide their nakedness before God because they were ashamed. You see, their consciousness, their, their mind state, their awareness had been shifted. And then they experienced emotions like they'd never experienced before, like fear. Uh, they became afraid. They, they had this sense that they were alone, that they were separated, that they were disconnected from God, that they were naked, that they were afraid. Things that they'd never experienced before. And that's because they followed the, the Luciferian de- deception. Now. Because they activated the law of sin and death, their whole system, body, soul, and spirit, began to crash. They were susceptible to diseases, infections. They began dying, and they never were dying before, getting old, getting wrinkles, etc., etc. And then they um, eventually would reach a particular age, and they would physically and biologically die. Now, it may have come from a heart attack or this disease or that organ failure or this biological problem or whatever, but something radically different occurred in their lives. They were now in the process of dying, and then every man and woman is now in the process of dying. And we do die biologically. Why? Because we have inherited their DNA, their genetic coding, and it's the genetic coding or the DNA which is like software that runs a computer. And so we have, you and I have, the, the fallen nature DNA of Adam and Eve. And because we have that fallen DNA in us, we're degrading, and eventually we die. <clears throat> now, when you study the, the uh, Old Testament, you see that all the people that lived and who we read about in the Old Testament before the flood of Noah, they all lived to be around 900 years old, 800 years old, 700 years old, 850 years old, or whatever. And then they would die. So they were living close to around 1,000 years old before they biologically died. And they all died, except for a few, like Enoch, who was taken up and taken up to heaven to be with God. So, <clears throat> they biologically died. Now, here's the thing, though. Every one of us, including Adam and Eve, <clears throat> are not just created biologically. We are a three-part being. We are a triune being. We are a trinity. So just like God, the biblical God, is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's a triune God or a three-part God, we are three-part beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. And so every one of us dies because we have inherited uh, the fall, the curse. We have inherited the DNA of God excuse me, the DNA of, uh, <clears throat> the fallen DNA of Adam and Eve. Now, what's interesting about this, when God first created Adam and Eve in paradise, in the Garden of Eden, there's some very important things to understand, and that is <clears throat> that God created us <clears throat> to be eternal beings. Adam and Eve were created to live in paradise as eternal beings. And so death 
was non-existent uh, for them before they fell. So what happens, and we read about it in the book of Genesis, Genesis, it teaches us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make man. Who's us? That's, that's, that's the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So then God said, let us make man in our image, <clears throat> according to our likeness, and then let them have dominion over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we were created by God to be in the image of God, which means we had the DNA of God in us, we had eternal life, and we were also given dominion or authority over our world and ourselves. And I'm talking about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. How is that possible? We have the DNA of God. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. <clears throat> then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion or authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that was on the earth. So you see, once again, we have to realize that Adam and Eve were created <clears throat> to be the king and queen of planet Earth and the Garden of Eden. And so this is what happened at the beginning up until the point Adam and Eve began to listen to uh, the serpent of old. And then uh, the death force enters the human race and a curse comes upon the human race. And let's remember that the curse always comes um, when God's people reject the word of God and disobey the word of God. So, from the Garden of Eden up until this present moment, you and I have uh, a fallen human nature is Adam and Eve activated the law of sin and death. So we're all in the process of dying. Now, where do we go when we die? Well, remember that because we are a body, a soul, and a spirit, the, the spirit is like the uh, <clears throat> spiritual uh, and, e and eternal dimension of every human being. Every human being has a soul, the psychological part, has a spirit, which is the eternal spiritual part, and has a physical or biological body. But because of the fall, we all die sooner or later. Now, this is passed on from generation to generation up until the present moment. Why do we die? Because God has constructed the universe and creation and mankind and this world according to his precepts and laws. And one of God's primary precepts and laws, beginning with Adam and Eve, was the flat out commandment of God. If you eat from the tree, uh, if you eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, you're going to die. That's going to be the penalty for your disobedience. You're going to die. So they did that, and they died. Now, it may have taken them a total of 700, 800 years or whatever, 900 years for that biological death to occur, but they all died. Now, remember, it was the biological body that died, but also they had a fallen human nature. So that meant that not only did their biological body die, but their spirit man or their spirit woman, that is eternal. Every one of us has a, has a spirit man or a spirit woman that will live on forever and ever and ever, that will live on for all eternity. Many Christians don't understand this powerful truth, and you need to understand this powerful truth. <clears throat> The point is that your spirit man lives forever. So what that means is 
even if your biological body dies, your psychological being dies, your spiritual man or woman will live on forever, eternally. The question is, where will your spiritual man or woman, or your spirit man or spirit woman, live eternally? And according to the Bible, it will live in one or two places. If you disobey God's word, which is what Adam and Eve did, you are under a curse according to the law of God. And because you're under a curse, first you biologically die, You eternally live forever, but because you disobeyed God's word, you activated the death force. You activated the the law of sin and death, which means that your spirit man and spirit woman will live forever, but you will live forever in a place called hell or the lake of fire, a place of eternal torment. And, And remember, The lake of fire, or hell, is God's supermax prison. I talk all about supermax prisons and hell in my book, uh, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And for those of you that are not familiar with what a supermax prison is, these are these, I don't know how many there are, let's just say in the United States alone, but these are these prisons that are high technology, They use all kinds of high technology and super construction and super walls and super guard systems and everything else. And they're called super max prisons from the term maximum security. So they are really super maximum security prisons, super max prisons. And they're impossible to to escape out of. So God has a super max prison for those people who rejected his word, who disobeyed his word. They are sent to God's supermax prison, known as hell or the lake of fire, a place of eternal torment, and they will live there for all eternity, forever and ever and ever, along with all all of those who chose to reject God's word, and people like the devil, Satan, and the fallen angels, etc., etc. So we now know that God is love. We've talked about that a lot in the Paul McGuire Report. So God devises a plan to save mankind, to rescue mankind from this, from this awful fate of spending all eternity in God's supermax prison called hell. But how can God do that? You see, it presents to God a dilemma, a conflict, a problem. And this is what a lot of non-believers, a lot of atheists, a lot of agnostics, and and, and tragically, a huge number of Christians and evangelicals simply don't understand the Bible. They, They don't understand that God has numerous... righteous, God is holy, God is merciful. So so many of these things that we're talking about appear to be, at, at face value, diametric opposites. How can God be righteous and patient or long-suffering at the same time? Because you see, when Adam and Eve deliberately broke the law of God by eating from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, they, they broke and disobeyed God's law. That When you disobey God's law, according to the law of God, you're supposed to receive a penalty or a punishment, just like here on earth. So the penalty or a punishment for breaking God's law Uh, in this case, from eating of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, is death. That's like the heaviest penalty there is, death. The penalty for breaking the law of God in the Garden of Eden by eating from the forbidden fruit was death. So 
The moment they disobeyed God, they began to die, and they were sentenced into the lake of fire for all eternity. Why? Because a man's spirit and a woman's spirit lives on forever. So you see, this is why there's a problem, and, and people, people are, are trying to impugn God. They're trying to, to label God as the, the biblical God as being. The, the, the biblical God is full of wrath and vengeance and, and, and the desire to wipe out his enemies. The, the Old Testament biblical God is cruel. The New Testament God is loving and kind. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. When somebody says that to you, it's because they don't. They don't have any clue about what they're talking about. They're just another of a, a million other clueless Christians. Who are just blabbing at the mouth and, and speaking about spiritual things with no knowledge. No, they're not speaking in a heavenly language. They're not speaking in tongues. They're speaking nonsense. Speak, see, there's a difference between speaking in tongues and speaking in nonsense. They're speaking in nonsense because their minds have not been renewed and they don't really understand the Word of God. Okay, so. Because man and woman were all created in the image of God and were born with an eternal spirit, <clears throat> that means <clears throat> that eternal spirit, by the way, is composed of living energy, the dunamis power of God, the dynamite power of God. And so it, it lives forever. And when a person dies, and every one of us will die, because we, we are essentially a spiritual man and a spiritual woman, we are going to live for all eternity in one of two places, depending upon what we believe in our hearts and how we act upon God's Word. So, if we simply disobey the Word of God and eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, then we're going to live forever in hell for all eternity. Why? Because our spirit man or spirit woman is, is eternal in nature. Now, you're going to biologically die, but your spirit man or your spirit woman will live for all eternity. It, it, except that if you have rejected God's word, the penalty is not only biological death, but you're going to live forever in your spirit man or spirit woman, in a place called hell. Now, if you choose to obey God and not reject his word and receive his forgiveness, and that's a whole story in and of itself about how God taught forgiveness through the Jews, through the law of God, which is the word of God, and how those people, God's children, the Jews, could uh, look forward to eternal life if they obeyed the law of God. Now, we have to remember that nobody can get into heaven through just their good works, or nobody gets into heaven based simply upon their obedience, because nobody has the righteousness that is uh, pure enough to open the door of heaven for us. So when we die, we will either go into hell, or we will go into heaven, because our spirit man or woman will live forever. So, obviously, no Jew could perform and obey the Word of God to the, to the perfect standard that God requires in order to get in heaven. Let's remember that according to the law of God, if you're trying to get into heaven based on obeying the Word of God, you have to hit the mark at 100%. Anything else than 100% obedience is called metanoia, which is the Greek word for missing the mark. And if you miss the mark, which is 100%, you are sentenced into hell and cannot be received to heaven. So metanoia is a, is a term similar to when you're shooting arrows at a, at a target and your arrow hits the center inner circle. 
that's a perfect shot for a dartboard. You throw a dart against a dartboard, and your dart lands in that very inner circle in the middle. That's a perfect shot. If every time your performance was a perfect shot, then you could get into heaven based on your performance. But the problem is, in reality, in the history of mankind, there has been nobody who has thrown the dart and hit the center target or fired an arrow and hit the center target perfectly. So nobody has kept the law of God perfectly. And as such, nobody, there's nobody who can enter heaven based on their 100% performance and obedience of the law of God, with the exception of one person in all of human history. And that person is Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ lived a perfectly sinless life. And even though Jesus Christ was tempted in all ways, just like you and I are, the difference between Jesus Christ and you and I is that Jesus Christ's obedience to God was 100%. Now, so God is, is, is saying, how can I get my people that I have created into heaven with me? Because my law demands 100% obedience. But none of my people can can hit that target perfectly. And therefore, if that's the case, and it is the case, then nobody's going to be in heaven but me, God. So the only way God could satisfy all of his, his character requirements, the only way God could satisfy his righteousness, his long-suffering, uh, his love, his patience, his holiness, and all his other attributes. The only way God could reconcile or work out a kind of cosmic balance accounting sheet where where, uh, a person could get into heaven, it, it could never come about through that person performing or obeying all of God's laws and rules perfectly. Because you see, if you were somehow able to obey all of God's laws and rules perfectly, then you could get into heaven. Problem is, with the exception of Christ, nobody has done that. So what God did, and this is what the purpose of the New Testament is all about, is God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of the Virgin Mary in an immaculate conception where where, uh, Mary's husband, Joseph, they had no sexual or physical relationship. She was a virgin, the Virgin Mary. But this is heavy because according to the world system and according to logic and reason, it is impossible for a virgin to uh, get pregnant and give birth to a baby, unless except you use uh, some kind of advanced fertility surgery or technique where you could uh, impregnate a woman without her losing her virginity. But when Mary was, was pregnant with, with Jesus, that kind of medical technology that was not available to the people at that time. So she experienced a virgin birth where God supernaturally impregnated Mary by the Spirit of God. Now, let's just leave that there, because that's all you need to know for for you to understand the powerful truth here. So what happened is that Jesus Christ was sending Jesus who was perfect, who was sinless, into this world to be a living sacrifice for all for each one of our sins. So all of our sins potentially have been removed from our lives if we will do one powerful thing. If we will put our faith in Jesus Christ to forgive us of all of our sins, 
we are then cleansed by the blood of Jesus from all sin. And then when we put our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in in Jesus' blood cleansing us from all sin, and then when we ask Christ into our inner man or woman, and we ask Jesus Christ to come inside of us and make us born again, God is faithful to do that, and then we become, by putting our faith in Jesus, brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. We become, we become a brand new man or woman in Christ Jesus. We are born again, and when we're born again by the Spirit of God and putting our faith in this gospel message, we're born again, and now we're allowed entrance into heaven. And the reason we're allowed entrance into heaven is because we're now sinless and we're born again as perfectly holy, pure creatures. You see, when we were born again, before we were born again, you and I and all men and women were descendants of Adam and Eve who were fallen. They had fallen DNA that they passed on to every one of us today. and. Because of that, every man or woman is now, that means you, that means me, we're now all, all of us are in the process of dying. We don't know how long we'll live, but every one of us dies biologically. And uh, then, depending upon where we've placed our faith, or whether or not we've obeyed the Word of God, that determines where we will spend all eternity, whether we'll spend it in a place called hell, or we'll spend eternity with a brand new glorified body in a place called heaven. It's that simple. So so, So there's several points here. The penalty uh, for sin is death. That's a law of God. And the only way to undo the penalty of death, which is a curse, that is upon all of us, is to put our faith in the fact that Christ has forgiven us of all of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, and then to ask Jesus to come into our lives and make us brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. And by putting our faith in Christ, we're born again. And when we're born again, the second we die biologically, whatever that is, to be absent from our physical bodies is to be present with the Lord. So in a nanosecond, in in a heartbeat, the moment we die, if we have put our faith in Christ, the moment we die, we enter into heaven which is in another dimension, and we enter into heaven, and we now possess our brand new, glorified, perfect, supernatural bodies that don't have any uh, faults or blemishes or imperfections on our brand new bodies. We have our brand new, glorified, eternal bodies, and we, you and me, The second we die are going to be be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The second we die, we're going to be looking into the eyes of Jesus Christ. He will be looking at us with his eyes of perfect love and acceptance. And we will be born again. We will have received already the gift of eternal life. And we will now live with our new man or new woman as new creatures in Christ Jesus. We will now live forever and ever and ever, for all eternity, in heaven, with Jesus and all the other people who have put their faith in God. And we will live in a brand new existence, a brand new reality, a brand new world, with a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And if you read the book of Revelation, it is such a, a trip. I mean, 
it's like when you read the book of Revelation, yes, there's there's the chapters that deal with the tribulation period and the Antichrist and Armageddon, the horrors of judgment and the wrath of God and all that stuff. Yes, that's all there. But also what's in the book of Revelation <clears throat> is a very clear picture of the eternal beauty and wonder and majesty and harmony of the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem that is so spectacular, it's so beautiful, it's so wondrous that the Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard about the the glory and the wonder and the beauty that awaits each one of us that have put our faith in Jesus Christ where we will spend all eternity. Now think about that for a moment. Actually, think about that for a moment. And and take a a deep breath and just calmly think about what, how beautiful and wondrous this new heaven, this new earth is going to be. And you're guaranteed entrance into it as long as you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now when I tell you to take a deep breath and thinking about it. I am not teaching you to engage in New Age mystical yoga. I'm not trying. I'm not teaching you a yoga breathing exercise. No, not at all. I'm simply saying meditate on on the powerful truth of God's word. Meditate. Think about uh, what your full in what your full and eternal inheritance is as a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So like what I'm saying to you is I'm not, I'm not preaching yoga to you. I'm saying slow down for a minute. Take a deep breath and think about how vast are the resources that open up to us who trust or who believe in Christ Jesus and ponder it for a moment. Meditate on it for a moment. And when I say meditate on it, I'm not talking about Eastern mystical pseudo-Christian meditation. Like there are, there are heretical teachings, uh, like uh, heretical teachings such as contemplative prayer. Now remember, before I, I was raised an atheist, but during my spiritual pilgrimage, I was heavily involved in New Age, Eastern mysticism, yoga, Hinduism, Buddhism, and all kinds of altered states of consciousness. I spent 15 years immersed in all those activities. I'm fully aware of the difference between true, authentic meditating on the Bible and the counterfeit meditation on the Bible, which is called things like contemplative prayer fully aware of the difference. And not only am I aware of the difference, I've written numerous best-selling books, which include my testimony about how I, uh, how God rescued me from the New Age and Buddhism, mysticism, how God rescued me from that deception, and how God saved me and showed me the truth regarding those things. And so I've taught Christian seminary classes on this topic, uh, Christian colleges. I've given my testimony of how I was delivered from the New Age and Eastern mysticism and received Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I've shared that testimony without any exaggeration to probably over I don't know, about 30 million people. And the reason that number is so staggering is because I've been sharing my testimony for like 40 years, and God has opened the door for me to to spend hours talking about my testimony on giant Christian television network shows, secular network shows, the History Channel specials, several History Channel specials. You know, all kinds of uh, Christian television, front pages of Christian magazine, radio. And you add, you add it all up, it becomes millions and millions and millions of people. I'll just give you one example. 
when I was on Sid Roth's program, it's Supernatural, a number of years ago, he wanted me to share my testimony. Testimony of how I was delivered from the New Age and the occult, became born again, and discovered the truth in Jesus Christ. Okay, which is my whole testimony. Well, not only did I share that on his hour program, uh, Sid Roth actually hired a, a director and actors, producers, and they made um, a, 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 a short movie about my testimony of how I was delivered from uh, the New Age and, and Eastern mysticism and how I was miraculously saved and became born again in Jesus Christ. So, so Sid Roth produced a, like a mini movie inside of his TV show, where an actor and actors and actresses played out my testimony. Okay, that reached, I don't know, that program alone reached something like a total of, after all these years, out of all its multiple distribution outlets, something like 7 million people or more. It's actually you can't even count the number because so so you have the, what was released by Sid Roth Ministries. It's supernatural, but then you have all the people who aired it on their uh, social media, and the number is in the countless millions. Now that's just one one example, and in fact, I'll put that up for you. Make sure you sign on to my Facebook pages. Or go to paulmcguire.us or sign on to my Twitter page and my other social media. You really need to join those things. There's a censorship war. I know I say this all the time, but, but there, are, there, there are people who despise my testimony. They have despised my testimony for 40 years because my testimony shines the light of Jesus Christ in distinct Contrast between the deceptive and demonic life of light of Luciferian deception. So he also produced a whole bunch of stuff uh, that brought my testimony alive. So visit paulmcguire.us, join the Facebook pages, join my other social media, and I'll put that up for you to watch. I'll put up there's there's a teaching I gave on Sid Roth. There's a whole bunch of stuff on that I did on Sid Roth programs because I was on the program uh, many times to talk about different topics and different books. But, but the testimony is most people's favorite and it's my favorite because it 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 illustrates my testimony, Jesus Christ, and how I was free from the way of deception. And so, and, and sometimes there are ministries. Because I've been doing this so long, I was on numerous television programs that don't even exist today. But there, once upon a time, when I was first doing this, there was no internet. There was no social media. The only way people could basically get your testimony was on television, Christian television, radio, pro, national radio programs. Uh, magazine cover stories, uh, featured stories in magazines. But, but you see, the technology was different 20 years ago than today. And I'm still doing it. I'm still sharing my testimony when I speak at conferences, when I speak at Paradise Mountain Church, and other places. But back in the beginning, there was no internet. There was no social media. So, for example, I number of times they did massive Christian magazines would, would do cover stories of my testimony. People would call me up. Major denominations, major Christian denominations. This is before some of these denominations backslid into apostasy. But I can think of a particular major, a huge denomination that did two uh, magazine covers, two separate magazine cover story issues of my testimony. And they, too, re recreated my testimony. So they had an actor wearing long hair and a girl wearing long hair. 
know, hippies were supposed to be me. And it, it was the story of how I, uh, God rescued me from the New Age and um, how I was miraculously saved out of the New Age and became born again. And both of these uh, uh, thick magazines were mailed to over a million people, like two million people, all over the United States and the world. I had never heard of this magazine. And the next thing you know, I see these two magazine cover stories that feature an actor that's supposed to be me with long hair. And, and they're distributing my testimony all over the place. And millions of people are reached. Or there was an organization. This was a massive organization this time. It doesn't exist anymore. Some of you will recognize the name. It depends how old you are. This international organization was called the Full Gospel Business Fellowship International. They invited me to, I began speaking at some of their meetings. Um, I would speak at their meetings. My honorarium would be a very humble, inexpensive, you know, salad bar lunch. Because the purpose of my ministry was not to make money. It wasn't to make money back then, then, and it wasn't to make money today. So, for for I would share my testimony, and people would get saved, and I would share it. I was a young businessman, like 25 years old. I was in the middle of nowhere in the state of Utah. No, I'm not a Mormon. My wife's not a Mormon. And I would speak at these obscure, out-of-the-way, full-gospel businessmen's fellowship luncheon meetings where there be, might be seven guys, 15 guys, 20 guys, or whatever. And, uh, you know, they would pay for my lunch, a salad bar lunch, and people would get saved. But they wanted to hear my testimony. And because I was faithful to toil, because I was toiling faithfully in obscurity, preaching the gospel, ministering the gospel, sharing my testimony in total obscurity, in the middle of nowhere, God did two things. He blessed me spiritually and raised me up spiritually, and he also blessed my career. And most of you probably don't know this, but at the time I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, which was like 1979, um, um, I was. What I did not know uh, was that Utah and Salt Lake City, Utah specifically, was the international home of independent feature filmmaking and independent feature film distribution. I didn't know it. I I I moved there to make my wife. Chris Happy. I walked away from two years after I was saved, um, where I was ma majoring in altered states of consciousness at the University of Missouri in filmmaking. Uh, I got saved miraculously at the University of Missouri. And uh, then uh, like two years later, I was in Manhattan, New York City, at a ministry called the Lambs Club, where God had me up on a stage as the host and the producer and minister of, of contemporary Christian music concerts in a Broadway theater on Times Square. Two years after I got saved, man, I had my hair was down to my belt buckle. I was still... You know, I just realized it right now. You know, I may offend some people by saying this, but you know what? Let the truth just fly wherever it will. I was being discipled. In, okay, so I was ministering for lunch, salad lunch, in Salt Lake, Utah. But that came afterwards. I go to New York City. I'm... I'm I, I joined this Christian ministry under Paul Moore, the Lambs Club. The next thing I know, I'm on the stage, and, uh, 
hosting contemporary Christian music concerts with people like Love Song and Chuck Gerard and uh, uh, Paul, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, folks singing. They were mega stars. Uh, uh, Love Song, uh, Keith Green came. Uh, Keith Green and I were hanging out at the Lambs Club. He drew, drove up into Manhattan in a giant motorhome. It was a schedule mix-up. And the next thing we knew, the night that Keith Green was supposed to perform, it was the night of the great New York City blackout where, like, all of New York and all of the Queens and everything, all blacked out. And I was right there in the center of Times Square. And Keith Green was supposed to go on. And something didn't work out. And... Thank God it didn't work out because people, I was out there in the streets when all the lights, like a bunch of Lego blocks would crash, like all the purple lights would go off, all the orange lights would go off, all the red lights would go off, all up and down Times Square. I was standing right smack dab in the middle of it and people were screaming, people were getting hugged and, uh, but, but it was, but God was protecting and intervening, because if we had had Keith Green in concert the night that he was supposed to be, our the people lining up to hear Keith Green sing would have been vulnerable to being mugged and killed and everything else. So all this stuff was going on, and look, I was barely saved. You know, God, I recommitted, I was miraculously saved on the back roads of Missouri hitchhiking. And the next thing you know, two years later, God gave Paul McGuire his boot camp. My boot camp is I joined up in, with a ministry that had a, a you know, giant bus, and we had a full crew of production people like me. I signed on as the guy in charge of the lights. I was supposed to be working under the light expert, the lighting expert. But for some reason, he couldn't come. So at the last minute, he trained me in the operation of the stage lighting, because we had like a country rock pop band play and a minister minister and would pack out churches all across the United States as we traveled by this giant bus all over the United States. And Paul McGuire, who basically had a handful of lessons and stringing lights and setting up light machine, you know, doing sound and lighting. Plus, I was terrified of heights. And, and, and then I had to climb these enormously tall light poles and walk out on balconies to light. I mean, it was crazy because my, I was terrified of lights. So anyway, I'm barely saved. God's still delivering. Sometimes we would drive the bus into a town you know, like Denver, Colorado, and the church had 5,000 people in it. Or, I, mean, I wouldn't perform, I was the lighting guy. So, so, but see, I was still being redeemed. So sometimes people would let us stay in their houses. People in the church would let the, the crew and the musicians stay in their houses while we, we performed in town for a couple of days. And I remembered I'd be sneaking in the bathroom of people's houses because I was still addicted to cigarettes at that time and I thought I was sneaking a cigarette and 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 for people who hate the smell of cigarettes I mean I stunk up their whole house with the cigarettes but they were kind to me and they were compassionate to me but God did that see God needed to lock Paul McGuire on a on a contemporary gospel music tour bus with a band with a minister with other people that was my spiritual warrior military boot camp because you see i was trapped on the bus with the musicians and performing there was nowhere i believe me in my sin nature i wanted to run out and get in trouble and sin because that was what my fallen man was still into but i was still growing as a babe in christ i was still growing as a young disciple in christ so my spiritual boot camp and it was a boot camp was touring around the entire nation. I mean, we went everywhere uh, with a 
with a Christian musical tour. It was called A New Way of Living. And it made a powerful spiritual impact. And then the next thing I knew, we came back to Manhattan. The same ministry brought, bought or purchased a Broadway theater called The Lambs Club. And I was hosting and ministering and producing and promoting major Christian contemporary music concerts. Giant artists of that time. This is before. This is before the time. There's many artists now. This was this was the first wave of a, what was called Jesus music or the contemporary Christian music scene. And um, this was all. I was in the middle of it. But my wife, who had come to Manhattan to be an actress from Utah, and she's not a Mormon. Uh, I first saw her on stage. I was producing a a Christian musical theater production on Broadway called Bright New Wings. And she was one of the actresses. And uh, you may be offended and whatever, but I'm sorry. You know, life is life. I happened to notice a pretty girl up on stage. And uh, I wasn't lusting. There's a difference between, now some of you are not going to get this, and most of you will get this. And you risk being misunderstood, but you just you've got to say it anyway. So, so I wasn't lusting uh, after this girl on stage. I did notice that she had beautiful legs. I don't call that lusting. Lusting is when you go through your imagination and you engage in in activities that you should not be engaging in or imagination. That's lusting. I'm single, admiring, not lusting, admiring a pretty girl on stage who's an actress singing and uh, performing in a Christian musical. That's not lusting. So anyway, I remember trying to get her to date me. And after, but she was always surrounded by guys. So one time I just cornered her in the middle of 44th Street, right in the middle of the street, because there was a deli across from the Broadway theater that we were doing all our stuffing. And I was going to get a cup of coffee. And I saw my chance. She was alone finally as she was crossing the street. And I walked up beside her and engaged in small talk. And ended up buying her uh, a little pumpkin pie and a cup of coffee, good New York coffee. And that little pumpkin pie snack, you, it may sound stupid saying it today, but, but it was romantic. In its context of how old we were at the time, I think we were both around 24 years old at the time, it was romantic. and We met each other there. But she hated New York City, even though she won a scholarship to the Juilliard School of Drama, even though she performed in uh, numerous plays in Manhattan. Uh, she, like many people, hated uh, Manhattan. Because if you're not a city person, uh, you're not going to like Manhattan. So anyway, she went back. We, we we were married shortly after that, <clears throat> about I don't know nine months after I asked her out. We were we were married, and uh, then after in the height of my career, God is promoting uh, the Lambs Club. We're being covered by national national television networks like CBS National and stuff. Bill Moyers, you know, the, 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 the CBS at the time and Time and Newsweek. And we were known as the Born Again Nightclub on Times Square, the Lambs Club, the Born Again Nightclub on Times Square, because there was many floors to the building. There was the giant theater, and there was uh, a floor above that, which was a giant ballroom for, for any kind of activities. We launched the Lamb Supper Club, where we, we served five course dinners all done by volunteers and with food left over at the Lamb Supper Club. People would, would come in from, from, they'd drive an hour or two or more 
people of all races and ethnic, ethnic groups that were all had a common thing. They were born again Christians, starving for fellowship and ministry and entertainment in a, in a, in a wholesome atmosphere. So we, you know, I would dress up in a, in a tuxedo, and uh, everybody else, the women would wear dresses, and and we gave a credible and the people all volunteered. So our the lady who was our chef, she was actually a chef uh, with a very classy restaurant. And yet she volunteered to be the chef of our five course Lambs Club dinners in the ballroom. And the other people volunteered and we got discounts from the meat district of the finest cuts of meat. But they knew we were a church ministry. And so they would give it to us at a big discount. and then. You know, we, I flew in Christian artists. They'd land uh, on helicopter and stuff. Uh, one girl, I forgot her name. Uh, she was famous at the time, but I had her flown in by helicopter. She landed on some the top of some skyscraper near the, where the Lands Club was. They would perform. People would get saved. We would get media coverage. But then my wife left. While while all of this was happening, because she could not, she just she just like could not take New York City. It, it's intense. We all know that. So we end up in Salt Lake City, where she is. Again, she's not a Mormon. I'm not a Mormon. I think I'm out there in the middle of nowhere. I I see to me because I'd never been to Utah before or Salt Lake City. I thought Mormons were exactly the same as the Amish people. So when I got off the jet, I was expecting to see, literally, I was expecting to see the wagons and uh, the, 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 the old dressing. I was expecting to see people looking, walking, acting, and dressing like Amish people. Well, when I got there, Mormons are, are totally different than the Amish. They, they, they dress in a contemporary way, etc. But, but you see, because I obeyed God and see always a spiritual principle. Spiritual principles that can, when you when you act on God's spiritual principles, when you act on when you obey God's spiritual principles, what happens always is that a curse is broken, a curse is reversed, a curse is blocked, and blessing is released. And, and, and as your brother in Christ, Paul McGuire, I want you to remember that because it comes into play in every situation in life. When you're obeying God and stepping out on faith and doing what God tells you to do, you you then release the blessing of God on your life, others. When you rebel against God, when you disobey God's word, you release the curse of God on your life. So the weird thing is, is that I mean, I, I went. I, we had, I, we had just finished this tour. Now we're ministering to thousands of people. We did a television special live. It's a gigantic five-hour telethon live on Times Square and live from inside the uh, Lambs Club. And we had Pat Boone and Pat Robertson and uh, Dean Jones. You know, the the, act, the actor, the Disney actor from the Love Bug series and. Uh, the name of the telethon was I Love New York. And, and, and millions of people tuned in because back then there was only channels 2 through 13. There wasn't cable and all that stuff. And, and so people were getting saved. And, but then in the height of it all, and this is what I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand. Well, I'm doing everything right, Lord. You know, I had lived a, a wild lifestyle before I got saved, but after I got saved, for example, I lived a pure lifestyle. And that means I practiced purity in my dating relationship between myself and my wife, Chris. Um, and so I, I thought, because I was being pure in our dating relationship, and I was putting Jesus first, I had prayed about our marriage uh, and fasted, because, because I was operating under the principle of no mind of your own, 
if you really want the will of God, you have to surrender your paths, surrender your desires, surrender your goals, dreams, and aspirations to the Lord. And then you have to be willing to listen to the Lord, to seek to, and wait until he speaks to you. And you don't do something just because you want to do it. You do something because you believe it's God telling you to do it. And obviously, God never tells you to do something against his word. So I thought, well, Lord, I, you, you should be blessing me. Well, he was in the career, and he was in the marriage. But, but there, there was tension and strife in our marriage because my wife literally could not stand New York City. It was driving her crazy. And I felt like God had kind of betrayed me. And, and so I had a choice. I could have ended my marriage, even though we were, had just been married for like six months. But, but my wife said she needed, she needed to get back to, to a more you know, country-type state like Utah. And uh, uh, I could have let her go, and my career would have prospered because it was prospering like crazy. Like I said, I'm barely saved. And, and God's using me, and, and thousands of people are getting saved. But I decided to walk away from everything. All the success of the ministry and everything that went, went with it, I walked away from everything to, to go back to Utah and, and, and put my wife first. If that meant I, I, I didn't even have a job lined up. I think I had, like, after paying for my airline tickets, I had, like, $500 in my name. I had one suit. I, got, I bought a really, really nice suit to get married in, but, but I was prudent. So I bought one nice suit to get married in. But that suit I planned to use for business and stuff, so that's why I didn't rent or buy a tuxedo. And, you know, I went to a lot of business meetings uh, in that suit that I got married in. People didn't know I got married in it. It was just a great business suit. I had no job. I'm in Salt Lake City. Ladies are greeting me on the street, and they are saying to me, uh, Thank you. I forgot what they said. They so they would say it in a Utah act, accent, but because I was wearing a a dark three piece conservative pinstripe suit with a red tie and a, and a crisp white shirt and shine black shoes, they thought I was a young Mormon missionary. Oh, so they thanked me for being a missionary because they thought because of my age and and the suit. The only thing they couldn't figure out is that my glasses were like more aviator type glasses. Remember, this is the, the not, this is 1977. No, no, no. This is 1978. We got married in 77. And so I am there in the middle of nowhere. I, Utah? But you see, because I put God first, which means I put my marriage first and my career second. That's God's priority. See, a lot of men don't know this today. A lot of women don't know this today. Even though I had trials and tribulations and adversities, okay? Even though I had huge trials, tribulations, and adversities, I was doing everything that I could conceive of to obey God and to put God first. So God supernaturally healed our marriage, okay? And so that's the blessing of God, because we're obeying him. And then, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I had no idea that Salt Lake City, Utah, was the, was the home of independent uh, feature films production and independent feature film distribution. And it's just, they're making feature films left and right in the middle of Salt Lake City, Utah. I had no clue. One of my goals in life was to be a filmmaker. That's why I majored in both filmmaking and altered states of consciousness at the University of Missouri. That's why I hooked up in terms of Christian ministry with the Lambs Club, because it was a media, it was a television, theater, film, 
uh, type of uh, uh, ministry. And so I get to uh, uh, Salt Lake, and, 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 and I still didn't know, after being there for months, I had no idea that they were making independent feature films there. Films like the Grizzly Adams films, films like the old Noah's Ark film, films like uh, Hal Lindsey's uh, uh, book made into a movie uh, called The Late Great Planet Earth film. And now these films, back then, this is back in, in 1978, 79, these films back then cost these companies about $500,000 to make. But remember, this is a long time ago. But they would generate at the box office and through movie theater distribution, they would generate like 30, 40, 50 million uh, dollars in profit, 75 million dollars in profit, which is better than the big Hollywood films. Because if your budget is only 500,000, and you're collecting through a, a, you're controlling the distribution, and you're bringing in fifty million dollars. That means you got forty-five million dollars in pure profit. Not me, but, but but the company that owned it. These companies were making a lot of money on on what they call low-budget family films, wholesome films. So I didn't even know these people were operating there at the time. And I remember I needed to go look for a job because my wife had a job working for one of the uh, ski resort hotels. And I went to look for a job. I didn't know where to find a job in Salt Lake City. So I had a nice attache case that somebody bought me as a, as a wedding gift. And I went downtown Salt Lake City to the, their biggest. Uh, very large office building, and uh, I looked at all the names of the companies in the directory in the hallway. It's a very prestigious building, and 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 I was praying the entire time, God lead, and I was claiming a job. I was praying for a job, and I was claiming a job in the name of Jesus Christ, and I was asking God to supernaturally lead me and supernaturally open the doors, or supernaturally close. Uh, cl- Closed the doors. And then I noticed that on the directory, there were a number of film companies. So I created a press release. I knocked on the doors cold and I struck up a relationship uh, with some people and with several, several feature film companies. And I ended up, started out as a PR man writing press releases. And then the next thing you know, <clears throat> I'm executive producer on one film and promoting other films. And these films are being released in theaters everywhere. And that eventually took us to Hollywood, but it took us to Hollywood with leverage. Because even though we were coming from Salt Lake City, Utah, the films that we were involved in were in the big Hollywood, you know, media publications. And they were they were money makers. So what's the point I'm trying to make here? is when you put God first, when you put God first, when you seek God's will above your own will, no mind of your own. I'm not not talking about playing mind games. I'm saying, if you're saying to the Lord, so I'm praying for months whether or not I should marry Chris, who I'm dating. And, And there's some other options. And, and But I said, Lord, I want the woman that you want for me above everything else. And so I lay down this decision before your throne, God, in prayer. You show me, Lord, who you want me to marry. See, the whole thing is not, who does Paul McGuire want to marry? Lord, you show me the person you want me to marry. You make it clear. and it, if, if you don't want me to marry this person, then shut the doors. Make it clear to me. Now, it's not that I'm saying you don't have a right to have your own desires. I'm not saying that you have to go around marrying somebody you hate. No, that's, that's, that's crazy stuff. 
What I'm simply saying is, when push comes to shove, and this is where many Christians get in trouble when it comes to important decisions like marriage and jobs, or where should I move, and should I move, etc., etc., they seek God, but then when God speaks to them, they ignore it. And see, so I was saying, God, you show me. See, and you have to come to a place of trust. Trust that God, I had to come to a place of trust where, where I had to trust God was not going to, because I had a secret fear that God would force me to marry somebody that I absolutely did not want to marry physically, emotionally, or personally. And, and that God would like speak to me and say, well, you need to, she's going to be your perfect spiritual companion. So you need to marry her to fulfill my destiny. And, and I would have to crucify my, crucify my flesh and basically bite the bullet and marry somebody that I, that I had no interest in. You know, a secret fear. No, you come to the place where you die to yourself. That doesn't mean God, God, God gives you desires that are wholesome, your own inner desires, like some people like. You know, strawberry ice cream, some people like chocolate ice cream, some people like vanilla. God works within your unique set of personality factors, your unique set of desires, etc. But the secret of the kingdom, the secret that releases God's blessing, is when you say, Lord, I'm going to give over this decision to you. I want to marry or take the job or whatever it is that you want me to. You see, it doesn't mean you're going to get an easy street path, but it does mean the blessing of God will be released. So, a point I'm making here, God miraculously opens doors for me to be in a feature film business in the middle of nowhere, Salt Lake City. That opens the doors for us to go to Hollywood, where I, again, God is opening doors. for me to produce science fiction feature films and promote feature films and everything else. In a way, he blessed me in a way that was so non-traditional, okay? So God is blessing me because I'm putting him first. What does it mean to put God first? It means that I won't have idols above him. An idol is a desire, a person, a career path, anything that you and I could potentially put above God is an idol. So if Paul McGuire, for example, was secretly idolizing the success of his career in Christian media ministry, and I put that before marriage to my wife, that would be, in a sense, an idolatrous choice. If I put, for example, my filmmaking career above my call to the ministry, or my call of God, that would be an idolatrous decision. And remember, the whole thing that the pilgrims and Puritans, what they, what they, they entered into a covenant with God based on Deuteronomy 28, which you hear me talk about on the Paul McGuire Report constantly, but it's a powerful truth that, would, that releases blessing. And Deuteronomy 28, the blessing and the curses, it says that if, you, if God's people will worship and put the biblical God first, okay, and God's people will choose not to worship idols or false gods of any kind, then God says all these blessings will be poured out upon you. But the condition is you can't worship idols, and the condition is you have to obey diligently the Word of God. And if you do those things, in Deuteronomy 28, these are the verses that the pilgrims and Puritans stood on when they got into a covenant with God in the 1600s, when they came to America, you can utilize these principles also. So in the practicalities of my decisions, who I was going to marry, where I was going to live. I put God first, 
I didn't make an idol out of my marriage. I didn't make an idol out of my wife. I didn't make an idol out of the success of my ministry. I didn't make an idol out of my filmmaking career. I don't I'm, look. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I was perfect. I, this was, this is the blessing of God was not based on Paul McGuire's perfection, but the intention and effort to put God's first, put God first, and to obey God caused God to bless me supernaturally. So when I would walk downtown Salt Lake City in my suit and my suitcase that somebody gave, leather suitcase, very classy attached, attache case that I couldn't have afforded for myself, but somebody bought it as a gift. And so, and, and as I'm walking downtown Salt Lake past some of these large buildings, one was the Schick Sun, Sun Classic. Uh, film company. They made Grizzly Adams. They made the Lincoln Conspiracy. They they made Noah's Ark and, and so many other hit movies. And um, then I would walk to downtown and I would see the feature film companies in the directory of these giant office buildings. And I hung out with successful feature film producers. And that brought me to Hollywood. But I produced a feature film and promoted feature films while living in in Salt Lake City. Yet at the same time, the the If My People movement was brewing through the United States. And Jack Hayford, my spiritual father, was, was a key instrument in that. I had yet to meet him. But when I was at the Lambs Club in New York City, a television producer, uh, flew in from California uh, and to meet with me and showed me on video the intercessory prayer musical known as If My People, where thousands upon thousands of Christians would pack a, a stadium and under the leadership of people like Jack Hayford and others, they would sing, If My People, and, and the whole thing, it was an intercessory prayer musical where we were, no, where they, I wasn't part of that yet. I was just watching a video. They would worship the Lord based on Second Chronicles 17, where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. And it was the call of God upon America. It was the call of God on the American church. Because remember, the time period here is 1970s. There are demonstrations, revolution in the streets, rebellion, the hippie movement, the counterculture, drugs, everything. And so he shows me this musical, and, and my wife and I, well, she was yet to be my wife, Chris, we, we could sense the power of God and the Spirit of God come down on the people. And the Holy Spirit touched us just watching this video of this intercessory prayer musical. And then we helped organize an intercessory prayer event based on If My People at at a large uh, hotel conference room at the Hotel Utah in downtown Salt Lake. And there's like 2,000 people in the room. And my wife is assigned to do a, because she's an actress, a a one-woman mini play for like five, eight minutes before all the people, based on if my people, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, who are called by my name. And you see you see, so God is blessing the filmmaking type things in, in our lives. God is blessing the spiritual thing in our lives. And the spiritual thing that God puts upon us back then was called If My People, which was a call for God's people in America to repent of their apathy and cry out to God for supernatural intervention. I just want to stop right there and remind you that here I am. That was like 19, I don't know what, what's 1978, and now. Here we are, 2000, towards the close of 2020. That 
that burden from the Holy Spirit about teaching God's people about the importance of repentance and crying out to God during America's crisis. If you were to stand back objectively and look at my life and say, what are the themes? What is my mandate? What is the call? Well, it's obvious. God put it in my heart to challenge, to exhort, to teach God's people to repent and to cry out to him for the healing of our nation. That he, he set our hearts on fire in the 1970s, and that fire continues to move. It's the heartbeat of this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church. It's why I write the books that I write with the titles that I write. It's why I wrote A Prophecy of the Future of America, where I share the vision God gave me on July 4th, 2012, where, where God takes me up. And I'm looking down on the North American continent, and I see God's people repentance, uh, repenting and revival breaking loose. See, same theme. God has a theme. I don't know. My mind's not big enough to wrap around all these themes. But God has a theme. God has a theme. But what unlocks the theme? What unlocks the theme for you? And I'll tell you what unlocks the theme for you as an individual. What will unlock the theme for you and your children and grandchildren? What will unlock the theme for you in your marriage, your second marriage? What will unlock the theme for you when you're up against the wall and it doesn't appear to be a way out? It's the same thing that unlocked it for me. And that is, you put God first, you humble yourself before God. You have no mind of your own. You seek God's will above your own will. And you obey God. And you make sure you don't have idols, okay? And which means worshiping false gods like careers and other people or whatever. And then you uh, cry out to God in prayer and you do what he tells you to do think out of the box, and when you obey those kingdom principles, you release the blessing of God, not only on yourself, but the people around you, your community, everywhere you go, and you release the blessing of God on whatever nation you're in, and God moves, and then the curse is reversed, and the curse is broken. I hope I'm communicating the core truth here, because we're we're talking about two intense dynamics. One intense dynamic is breakthrough in in the realm of ministry and career and family and overcoming challenges, etc., etc. And the other is breakthrough in the area of what God's primary theme, what God's primary call is for your life. And what I want to share with you is that these two principles work in synchronization. These two principles have to hook up properly for the blessing of God to be supernaturally released in your life with power. You you will not, please hear me, I'm telling you this out of the agape love of Jesus Christ. Please hear me. You will not receive the blessing of God that you're seeking. And neither will our nation. Unless you're able to line up these, what appear to be two different areas. The key is when you line up in synchronization with God's will by obeying God and God's principles according to God's word. And when you begin to line up your life in synchronization, you don't have idols, and you're doing what God wants you to do, you will, yeah, you'll have trials and tribulations. You'll have spiritual battle. Yes, you will. And I'm not just going to lie to you and say, you know, then everything goes wonderful. That's not how it works. You still have spiritual battles. You still have prayer uh, wars. You still have to engage the enemy. But you will live and begin to see 
God's divine supernatural intervention in your life like you've never seen it before. You will begin to see the blessing of God released in your life like you've never seen before. You will begin to see the favor of God open doors like you've never seen before. And not only just upon you, but upon your children and grandchildren and upon your nation. If you line up according to the Word of God. See, these, it always works on the macro level, the, the big level, and then the micro level, the, the, like the personal level. So, the key to receiving a powerful anointing that continues, and you continually walk in it, the key to receiving God's favor, the key to to being used by God, the key to uh, God opening doors, God making a way where there is no way, the key to all of it is when it's just you and God alone, what's going on? What's really going on? Now, I know that I'm speaking to you right now. I can feel it. It's like, once again, there's this sense of a powerful electrical field in in the studio where where I'm recording the broadcast now. And I can feel this powerful electrical field. And it's not New Age. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the presence of God invading quietly and gently, if you will, the studio where I'm speaking to you from. The microphone that I'm speaking into now, whether you're listening to me in Europe or uh, the Middle East or South America or North America or Canada or Australia, New Zealand, wherever you're listening to me, the anointing that is in this room is also anointing my words and it's flowing out of me and it's ministering to many of you for which it's intended. And I encourage you to receive it, not as some blind-eyed cult follower, but to receive it in comfort because you've done your homework, you've read the Word of God, and you know that you know that what I'm sharing with you is in synchronization and lines up with God's Word. See, if what I'm saying to you didn't line up with God's Word, and you should flee from it as apostasy and false teaching. So, let's 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 look at it from a macrocosm. Right now, we have a coronavirus in the USA and around the world. Do not allow the fear of the coronavirus or the medical fears, the economic fears. Do not allow the spirit of infirmity, and do not allow the spirit of fear that is associated with the coronavirus to attack you and to rob, steal, and kill from you a plan of God for your life. Do not allow the spirit behind the coronavirus to rule or reign over your life or your consciousness. Don't allow it. Remember what God has told you. Remember what God has told me, is that Deuteronomy 28, if we worship the true biblical God first, and we have no other gods before us, in other words, you're not, I'm not worshiping idols, but only the true biblical God, and then to make sure that we're hearkening diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, in other words, that we're reading the word of God, and then we are diligently applying, knowing the Word of God, and then applying and living by the Word of God. If we do those two primary things, we're in sync with God. And when we're in sync with God, then the curse and the curses of Deuteronomy 28 are blocked, broken, and bound. And the supernatural blessing of God is released upon our lives, our children's lives, our jobs, careers, ministries, family, so on and so forth. 
but the but but what releases the blessing of God is that we worship God of the Bible only, and we don't worship idols, and that we hearken diligently to to obey the voice of the Lord our God, which is to obey the Word of God, to know the Word of God, and then to obey the Word of God. Since the time when I talked to you about the early years of my ministry in New York City and the Lambs Club and all that stuff. And I've written 34 books. And by God's grace, through all kinds of media and magazines and print and traveling to places like Malaysia and France and other places, through all these means that God opened up my testimony, God has given me a message, message, and through media has ministered to millions of people. Now, the point is, That since that time that I referenced to you when I talked to you about these things, I've seen many individuals that I know walk astray of the plan of God. I've seen entire denominations walk astray from the plan and power and purposes of God. I've seen churches and big pastors subtly walk away from the plans and purposes of God. And I've seen our nation, tragically and sadly, walk away from the plans and purposes of God. What do I mean by that? You go back to hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God in Deuteronomy 28. That means you've got to know what the Word says, and you have to obey what the Word says. So you see, if you're in ministry, you're a Christian, and all of a sudden, you have accepted a false doctrine and false teaching of critical race theory, which is a communist, Marxist teaching system that I explain with full documentation in my book, Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. I further explain it in my book, Mass Awakening, and I explain it in volume one and volume two of A Prophecy of the Future of America. And you can get all of those books and others that are just as important at financial bundle discounts right now at paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Because I've spent 40 years studying this stuff and more. So, the reason America is in the this fierce demonic warfare that we're in now, that that involves you and I as born-again individuals and the saints of God versus those that are following the great apostasy, the great falling away, those that are not rightly dividing the Word of God, and yet at the same time, simultaneously, the clock is getting us closer and closer and closer to the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before that time happens, we're supposed to be being busy about our Father, our Heavenly Father's kingdom business. And what is the essence of the kingdom business? Jesus said it to his disciples. You are his disciple. I am his disciple. Jesus Christ said, look, the fields are white for harvest but the laborers are few. Jesus is saying, look all around you, my children, look all around you. People are crying out to God secretly. They're secretly aching because of this coronavirus and the loneliness and the anxiety and the depression and the fear that goes along with it. People are are being driven out of their minds, and they're starving for an answer. And if you will come to them, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the agape love of Jesus Christ, and minister to them the message of salvation, you will help me, Jesus, bring in the last day soul harvest. That is the primary purpose of Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church. From the beginning, from 40 years ago, And why I'm sharing this with you is that when you have two pivotal spiritual battles, you have the 
macro battle for America and the other nations in the world in the time of our greatest crisis. And that's why I called my latest book The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. You can get it at paulmcguire.us. That's why I called my book that. And it's a battle for the mind that involves the demonic and mind control and many heavy-duty things, which I explain in my book, Conquering the Matrix. Again, all of these books are available at paulmcguire.us. So when we line up in the service of God, when we put God's God first, and when we obey God at the highest levels, then we're lined up, we're in sync with God. That releases the blessing of God upon our lives. That means the blessing of God on your job, your career, money, guidance, the need for wisdom, the need for favor, the need for protection, the need for deliverance for yourself, deliverance for your children and grandchildren and friends and people you're praying for, deliverance from, for America from the powers of evil. Yeah, deliverance for America from the powers of evil. When each one of us, as individual members of the supernatural body of Christ, choose to come into right alignment with God, then you and I, as supernatural members of the body of Christ, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with the filled with the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit, the dynamite, explosive power of the Holy Spirit, clothed with power from on high, anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. When each one of us chooses to obey God, to walk in, in, and live and minister in the power of the Holy Spirit, an anointing comes down from heaven and not only rests upon us, our homes, our families, our businesses, and our ministries, but that anointing of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit, also begins to infill us supernaturally and infuse us supernaturally, so that the anointing of God, literally, we are clothed with the supernatural power of God. What does that mean? Well, when Adam and Eve, back in Genesis in paradise, the Garden of Eden, when they were in a right relationship, when they were synchronized up with the Creator, capital C, God, God gave them the supernatural authority to rule and reign paradise, the Garden of Eden, like the king and queen of planet Earth. When they violated the covenant with God, by disobeying God's word and eating from the fruit of the tree in the middle of gar- the garden, they, they severed their power source. They activated the law of sin and death. They lost their anointing. They lost their eternal life. They became ashamed. For the first time, they became aware of their nakedness. You see, the awareness of their nakedness occurred because they chose to sever the power lines of the Spirit of God between the biblical God and themselves through disobedience and unbelief. When they severed those power lines, then all of a sudden, for the first time in their lives, they experienced fear and they were aware of their nakedness. And then they activated the law of sin and death and they began to die. This same spiritual principle continues on in my lifetime and in your lifetime right now. Right now, this same dynamic spiritual principle is at work. So, when we discover that the early apostles, the disciples, were were not capable of accomplishing anything that God told them to, to do, based on their own strength or wisdom, it wasn't in them. They didn't have enough power to to do all the things that Jesus told them to do on their own strength. 
They needed a power above and beyond themselves. So they met in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and while they were in one accord, that meant they were in agreement. That means they were in a oneness. That means they were praying in true biblical unity. As they're seeking God on the day of Pentecost in the upper room, we read in the book of Acts that as they're praying in one accord, the power from on high, the dunamis dynamite power of God begins to be poured out upon them, and they're clothed with power from on high. The, The dunamis, the explosive dynamite power of God from on high. They're clothed with power from on high, and now they're supercharged with the dunamis force of the Holy Spirit that gives them the supernatural ability to triumph over the devil, the demons, and the enemies of God. They have supernatural power to be overcomers and to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So we read this in the book of Acts. This same spiritual principle that worked for the apostles and disciples over 2,000 years ago works for us. So, in Acts chapter 1, it says, starting in verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. What's the promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit. Which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together as one, true biblical unity, not false uh, ecumenical unity, true biblical unity, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And and he said to them, um, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, they were angels, stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So so Jesus is ascending into heaven. But the angels of God are saying to the disciples, this same Jesus are going to re- the same Jesus who you're watching go into heaven now, he's going to return in the same way he went up into heaven. That's the second coming of Christ, which we're approaching quickly, that time zone. And so they're praying in the upper room, all right? The power of God is coming upon them. The power of the Holy Spirit is coming upon them. When you draw close to God and you draw close with other believers, before our regular Paradise Mountain Church services were interrupted by the the laws of the state of California, we were able to regularly, physically gather together in one accord and seek God, and the power of God in meeting after meeting would come down with power and force, and we would see the miraculous, we would see miraculous answers to prayer, etc., etc. But you can do that in your own home. You can do that now after listening to me minister to you. That door is open to Jesus anytime you want to take advantage of it. So, um, In Acts chapter 2, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord. 
oneness, not counterfeit satanic oneness, as is the case in Genesis 11, when the people of Babylon came together as one to worship Lucifer. Not that. Biblical one accord. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from, from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon uh, each of them. And it continues on. And, and how the power of God flooded down upon them and on the streets, and people tried to mock Peter and the apostles, accusing them of being intoxicated and drunk by saying they are full of new wine. And Peter rebukes them with the word of God because they aren't filled with new wine. They're not drunk. They're not going through craziness, okay? This is what Peter says, verse 15. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. You know, we have seen so many blood moons. We've seen so many <clears throat> uh, signs in the sky, especially with the moon and, and the sun. Uh, unprecedented. It just uh, a couple of days ago, you could stand outside, which I did, and look up into the heavens at night. And I believe it was uh, the proximity or closeness of uh, Jupiter and, and Saturn. They were at an all-time closeness. And that has, has not been seen in, in such a long time. So it was considered the, the physical closeness in the heavens of the planet Jupiter and the planet Saturn was deemed to be a sign of the time. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is so powerful. So powerful. And all you have to do, and all I have to do, as members of the supernatural body of Christ, what we have to do is we have to line up our lives personally in synchronization with God and his word, and then obey by faith God and his word. And if you will do that, and I will do that, and if we spread this message far and wide, and if we can exhort and encourage believers to do that all across the USA, all across the world, we will see in our lifetime a massive paradigm shift where the power of God the angels of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, will come down upon the earth, bringing in the last day's soul harvest, <clears throat> and getting planet earth ready <clears throat> for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in addition to that, when you and I choose to, to sync up with God, like many of you right now are hearing my voice, and you're saying in your heart and mind, yes, I want to sync up with God. I want to line up with God. And you're doing it. It's just a small inner choice. You're making the choice to hook up with God on a deeper level. And to the degree you do that, and, and to the degree you walk in that, you are going to release the supernatural blessing, supernatural miracles, supernatural provision, supernatural deliverance, 
and the supernatural power of God will be poured out upon you, your family, every situation you encounter, deliverance upon your children and grandchildren, deliverance for our nation. Never give up. Don't give up regarding our nation. No matter what is happening at this particular moment, never give up. Never retreat from the battle regarding our nation or whatever nation you live in. God is almighty. We cry out to him, and Jesus Christ will rise, and he will deliver his people. That's his promise to us. We need to repent, but we need to keep crying out to God. And as we cry out to God, the Lord will shake the earth, the Lord will shake our nation, and the Lord will bring down the wicked and the evil And he will raise up the righteous, and we will see miracles, wonders, signs, a authentic biblical great awakening, and we will see the power of God bring in the last day's soul harvest. All of these things will happen, and we're on the precipice of all of this happening in in the very near future. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I need you to spread this message far and wide. We are in a raging war between the big tech giants, the social media giants, the internet giants, the search engine giants, who are actively censoring the gospel message we preach. We are in an all-out war where people are blocking our access to all kinds of communication technologies that would normally allow us to win souls for Jesus Christ. They want to block that. They want to barricade that. So I need your help by obeying, asking you to obey the Holy Spirit and sending the links and sending our messages far and wide, joining our social media groups, following them, uh, playing the social media game, becoming members of our social media pages, following, spreading the links of our programming, our audio, our video, our messages. By doing that, you help us do an end run around their computer algorithms, which are designed to censor us out of existence. We can still win the battle, but we take the battle to a personal level where we spread the message. We're not relying on some big search engine company to spread our message. And then number two, the essence of this warfare is spiritual. So I want to thank God for each and every one of you who have chosen to engage in spiritual warfare, intercessory prayer for this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church, me and my family. We need your constant 24-7 spiritual warfare. And not only for me, but for our nation and for critical issues that are happening in our nation. And then all warfare needs resources. It needs finances. It needs assets. So I'm asking you, as we have to increase the level of intensity of our communications warfare, of our technological warfare, and our spiritual warfare, we must also increase the intensity of the financing of the spiritual warfare we're engaging in that allows us to save souls, win the lost, preach a biblical worldview, and ignite a biblical revival in America and in other nations around the world. That requires that we receive substantially uh, higher amounts of monies and gifts and donations on a monthly basis because we have to spend more money to, to participate in alternative social media platforms, brand new social media and internet platforms, the development and acquisition of apps that we can distribute, the production of video and television. We have offers for to, to go on different television networks, but we need to raise money to actually do it. We have offers to create our own internet network using new technology, but we need additional finances to do that. 
So I'm asking you to, to simply go to the Lord. And if this ministry has been a blessing to you, if it's strengthened you, then I'm asking you to simply ask Jesus what you should do. And then whatever Jesus speaks to your heart in terms of donations, financial contributions, and giving, and simply obey the Lord. Simply obey the Lord. Because that's just your way and my way of lining up and being in sync with the Lord on every level. And you will discover, as I have and many of you have already discovered, when you're faithful to the Lord, the Lord is faithful to you. We need each other. Because unless we unite in that authentic biblical oneness, we won't be able to defeat the adversary who is lusting to take down our nation. And we cannot allow it. We need to occupy the land. That's what Jesus commanded us to do. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Join our social media groups. Visit paulmcguire.us. Take advantage of our numerous book bundle discounts at paulmcguire.us, and spread these messages far and wide. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire.